Now we're going to move on to the details of pulse compression and introduction. Uh, we'll talk about linear frequency modulation, phase coded waveforms, and other coded waveforms, and then summarize. Now let's first talk about the motivation uh, for why we want to do pulse compression. High res range resolution, as I had just briefly said earlier, is important for most radars. You'd like to be able to characterize the target and identify it. So the more resolution you can get in range or an angle, the better it's going to be is to see whether you have a fleet of aircraft that you're looking at, or one aircraft, or a small aircraft. So um, there, that's an important factor. Accuracy and uh, resolution are very important. So we want the best measurement accuracy possible. And high, resol high range resolution can be obtained with short pulses. So we send arbitrarily short pulses uh, and the bandwidth is inversely proportional to the pulse width. So these would be very high bandwidth, very short pulses. But the, there's a limitation on short pulses. They have very high peak powers required to get a large amount of energy in that pulse. And as I said earlier in the lecture, that you want to put as much energy on the target at far ranges so that you'll have enough signal to noise to see it. And the two things that matter are power and aperture. And if you can't put the the aperture is uh, power is the amount of average power that you can put on that target. And if you can't get enough average power, enough energy on that target, you're at a disadvantage. So high peak power is required for large pulse energy. And at that high peak powers, arcing can often occur, especially at higher frequencies, as we'll see later, especially in airborne radars. So if we have an airport surveillance radar, which a typical one has a megawatt of peak power, a one microsecond pulse, and about a kilowatt of average power, if for a 150 meter range resolution, um, energy in one pulse is a joule. Uh, to obtain 15 centimeter resolution with the constraint, uh, the energy per pulse to one joule, that implies a nanosecond pulse and a gigawatt of peak power. And that's just a very unreasonable thing to expect out of an S-band radar. Um, mod, uh, the, with the klystrons and the, uh, the uh, magnetrons that, that are used in these radars. And also airborne radars ex ex experience at higher uh, altitudes break down at, at, at lower voltages than ground-based radars. So you'd like to keep the power, average power, as low as you reasonably can. Uh, another thing is to what to what happened in technology. Uh, after people made two uh, transmitter amplifiers out of tubes, clusterons, we're going to see that in the last lecture, and amp and um, 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 different types of uh, magnetrons, clusterons, and other big power amplifiers, uh, people developed solid state transmitters able to operate at high peak powers, especially when you gang them together in series and parallel. But the energy that comes from long pulses, uh, you get with, the, with these, you get moderate peak power. You typically get with solid state transmitters 25 to 20 percent maximum duty cycle, as opposed to a tenth of a percent or one percent duty cycle that you'll typically get with uh, the S-band magnetron or clustron or something like that. Usually, uh, long pulses using standard pulse CW waveforms result in rel relatively poor range resolution. A long pulse can have the same bandwidth, that is the same resolution, as a short pulse. And this is the real takeaway from this view graph. If we modulate that pulse in frequency or in phase, and by modulate it, I mean change it. 
if we start off with a, a, a low S band and work our frequency up linearly to a high S band, or if within the, the sine wave that's within the pulse, we um, change the phase up and down, plus or minus 90 degrees, excuse me, plus or minus uh, zero to 180 degrees, zero, 180 degrees, at, uniformly at different places within the pulse, that can modulate the pulse. And this pulse compression, using either frequency or phase modulation, allows the radar to achieve at the same time the energy of a long pulse and the resolution of a short pulse. Now, the two most important classes of pulse compression that we're going to you run into uh, are linear frequency modulation, FM or LFM pulses, and binary phase coded pulses. And by binary, I mean zero phase change or 180 degrees phase change. And in notation that you'll see, a plus means we didn't change the phase, the zero change in phase, and minus means we flipped the phase 180 degrees. You'll see that in little um, figures that we're drawing later on. Now, let's look at what, what are the gains in the trade-offs, what you get in, in terms of the real world and resolution with, with pulse width, bandwidth, and resolution for a square pulse. Now, here we have uh, a, a blue low bandwidth pulse that's longer than our target, in this case, a fighter aircraft. And here we have a very short pulse, maybe a tenth of it or so. I haven't measured it and uh, didn't do it accurately. But a small, um, this pulse will reflect individually off the nose, this little bump up here, the cockpit. The back of the cockpit's always shielded with armor in most fighters. That'll reflect back the wings and the, the, what's ever in this pod and the elevators and 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 different things that, that that all poke in and out of most modern aircraft and you'd be able to resolve them here in red with a high bandwidth in red say a tenth of the low bandwidth the low bandwidth you just get a bump back which is somewhat smaller in the front and higher in the back, but you'd see individual scatterers with the high bandwidth. And this is a metaphorical example. I just put in relative cross-sections, and it isn't meant to be characteristic of this particular plane. I forget whether it's a U.S. or a foreign plane or whatever. But it's just meant to be a rough idea that shorter pulses have higher bandwidth and better resolution. Obviously, you'd like to get this kind of resolution than that. And that's why we use pulse compression. Now, exactly what do we mean when we look at it? And this is to define what we mean by binary phase coding and linear FM waveforms. First, let's look at our baseline waveform. Um, it's a pulse width T, and within that envelope, uh, you've got a sine wave moving up and down and then stopping. That's the pulse of energy we send out with a, a, a they call it a CW modulated uh, square wave. The bandwidth is 1 over the length, and the time bandwidth product is 1. Okay. And now the resolution of a short pulse can be achieved, as we said, by increasing the time bandwidth product. And here are the two ways we do it. With binary phase coding, what we do is we flip the phase or not flip the phase of a time portion of this pulse. And what I've done is I've used this small portion, tau, as the f that's the time over which we flip or don't flip the pulse. I picked it to be just for visual purposes a half of a uh, a pulse uh, of a wavelength, 
to make it easy to draw. It could be a quarter, it could be any whatever the number is. Uh, usually within a pulse width there'd be thousands of these at microwave frequencies. There'd be thousands of these uh, uh, wavelengths. But for visually showing you this, uh, here we haven't flipped it and we still haven't here and here we've flipped it and and so there are some times where you get a plus for not flipping it and a plus for not flipping it. Here we get a minus because we flipped it 180 degrees. So there's different places along the pulse where we've changed it or we haven't changed the coding. And that's binary phase coding of this waveform. And the bandwidth that we'll get out of it is 1 over the small t which is going to give us a higher bandwidth because this is a small is a larger number in time excuse me this is a smaller number in time so we're going to have a higher bandwidth and that gives us better time better time resolution better range resolution and the time bandwidth product is capital T over tau so if the, if the, if if uh this small t, 10 of them, or capital T, you'd have a time band with product of 10. If, it was a, if this was 1,000th of the whole pulse length, you'd have a time band with product of 1,000. That means we'd be able to divide this up into 1,000 range subpulses, we call them. With linear frequency modulation, we do it differently. The time band with product is equal to the length of the pulse times delta F which is the frequency we start with which here it's longer and here we go to higher frequencies and here we have F1 so and it's the magnitude obviously so the time bandwidth product is just T times delta F times the difference in frequency where the frequency is moved linearly as time progresses within the pulse. Now let's look in detail at linear frequency modulated waveforms. Uh, here's a linear frequency modulated waveform with increasing frequency. And this is what the frequency as a function of time would look like. There'd be a time with no energy, and then at F1, and then we go up to higher frequencies. Let me find the arrow. We'd linearly move up to higher frequencies. And the time bandwidth product is equal to B times capital T, and the bandwidth is just the difference between the two. And the output of the pulse compression filter, and we'll talk in a minute how we implement those, uh, this is the bottom to bottom at the half max, it's 1 over B, uh, of the, of the pu pulse compression filter. So this is the pulse compression filter, the output of it. And if we had decreasing frequency, we'd have the frequency decreasing down here and, and the same output. Now, because the range is measured by a shift in Doppler frequency, there is a coupling in range and in Doppler velocity measurement. That is shown in this view graph. Here we have a transmitted waveform and the transmitted waveform has a slope B over capital T. Here's the, the change in frequency over capital T. And say we have here we have a received waveform. Now, and it's from a stationary target at range CT divided by 2. This corresponds to a certain range. Now, when we have uh, CT plus that 
the, that T plus another tau, a capital T, is that extra time caused by a Doppler shift of the frequency because the target is moving, or is it due to the, the target's farther away? And that's what's the coupling that happens. And, and in, the, in this case, if the motion it would be, the Doppler frequency would be B times small t divided by capital T would be the extra shift in frequency. But it could be caused by a stationary target that moved an extra distance. So range and Doppler measurements are coupled with frequency modulated waveforms. Now there are a couple of characteristics of these waveforms I'd like to point out. First, that these F linear FM waveforms, uh, the pulse compression filters, that is the receive, receive signal that you get back, you have to pr pass through a pulse compression filter. That's the matched filter that will find you, that will optimize the signal to noise ratio for you at the given range that your, your, your target is. And what we usually do is implement that digitally. And A to Ds can often provide very wide bandwidths with required high resolution digital pulse compression radar. So if you had a 5 megahertz bandwidth, uh, a nice high bandwidth radar, and uh, A to D is easily make it 5, 10 megahertz. They're ideal for just doing pulse compression on the whole length of the pulse duration, the whole PRF, and go that way. And they're referred to as narrow band pulse compression in the two classes of linear FM waveforms. If you have very high bandwidth, like a well at X band, that's about close to 10, 9 gigahertz, let's call it 10 gigahertz, uh, you can get a gigahertz of bandwidth, but you can't get a gigahertz of bandwidth in an A to D converter. So you have to use different techniques, high bandwidth pulse compression techniques. And the most popular, the one used most is so-called stretch processing. We're going to be going over that a little bit later. Now for um, just uh, a general overall statement about where linear FM pulse compression is, um, we, we, we can process the linear FM pulse compression waveforms and then generate them at low powers with digital methods. That's called good. You don't have the variability with temperature and whatever. Uh, when you've got A to Ds that are appropriate with the required bandwidth, as I said previously. The digital methods are stable and can handle long duration waveforms. And these are all the different basic digital implementation good things that you'd like about that. You can have multiple bandwidths of pulse durations, different types of pulse compression modulation, good phase repeatability, uh, low time side lobes, and, and flexibility if you want to change waveforms. Here are the different methods that can be used for a linear pulse compression. This is the direct convolution in the time domain. You take the uncompressed received echo and we convolve it with the, uh, the reference transmit signal attenuated a lot and out comes the compressed pulse. So we need to do some A to Ding on these things and then just perform a convolution, a digital convolution. And then in, there's a frequency domain implementation where we can take the uncompressed received echo, take the discrete transform of it, take the transmitted reference signal attenuated, because we're going to be dealing at low voltages, and take a D, a DFT of it, and then multiply the two discrete Fourier transforms, and then take an inverse discrete Fourier transform, and that, as you remember from digital signal processing lecture earlier, is a digital implementation of a convolution, and out will come the compressed pulse.